Hi everyone, and welcome back. In this lesson, I'm going to show you a brand new notation that will allow us to conveniently describe how quickly a function is growing near a given point. It's called big O notation, and it's used very commonly in computer science to describe the complexity of algorithms. In this course, however, we're going to be using big O notation to help us perform computations with Taylor series. In particular, it will really help to clean things up when adding two Taylor series, multiplying two Taylor series, or taking limits with Taylor series, something I'll show you very shortly. Now notice that this section corresponds to pages 144 to 151 of the course notes, but it is not present in our calculus e-text. So please make sure you carefully review these pages from the notes. Okay, so what is big O notation? Well, it all starts with two functions, f and g. We'll say that f is of order g as x approaches some point x0 if we can find a single positive constant c such that the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to c times the absolute value of g of x. This should hold for all points x near this x0, but not necessarily at x0 itself. Sometimes these functions won't even be defined at x0, so we just need this result to hold nearby. What this definition is really saying is that f is of order g, provided that the size of f is comparable to the size of g around this point x0. If that's the case, we'll write f of x equals big O of g of x as x approaches x0. Now, I know this definition feels a little abstract, so the purpose of this video is to go through lots of examples and explore the basic properties of big O. Okay, for your first example, consider the function f of x equals x cubed, whose graph is shown here in blue. Notice that near x equals 0, x cubed is always less than or equal to x squared, the graph shown in green. In fact, even on the negative x-axis, if you imagine taking the absolute value of your cubic, causing the graph to flip up, it's still going to lie underneath y equals x squared. So therefore, we can say that the absolute value of x cubed is less than or equal to a constant, in this case 1, times the absolute value of x squared. And that's going to hold for all x values on the interval minus 1 to 1. In particular, it holds near the origin. So according to our definition of big O, we can say that x cubed is of order x squared as x approaches 0. Notice that we could have also said x cubed is of order x as x goes to 0. After all, the function g of x equals x, graphed here in dark blue, is even bigger than x squared in absolute value near the origin. And therefore, it must also be bigger than x cubed in absolute value near the origin. So according to our definition of big O, x cubed is of order x as x approaches 0. We could even take this one step further. We could say that x cubed is of order 1 as x goes to 0. The function g of x equals 1 is shown here. And clearly, this function is larger than x cubed in absolute value near the origin. Now note, saying that a function is of order 1 as x goes to 0 is really just saying that the function is bounded in absolute value by a constant c, right? All that means is that the function doesn't have a vertical asymptote at the origin. The function's values aren't blowing up to infinity, they stay bounded. Before we move on to our next example, here's a small but important observation. If x cubed is equal to big O of x squared, then k times x cubed is also going to be big O of x squared, where k here can be any constant you like. Don't believe me? Let's just go back to the definition. If I multiply x cubed by k, then in absolute value, this is going to be equal to absolute value of k times absolute value of x cubed. But we agreed that near x equals 0, this term was bounded by x squared in absolute value. So kx cubed in absolute value is bounded by this constant times the absolute value of x squared. We conclude that kx cubed is also equal to big O of x squared. We've just seen that as x approaches 0, x cubed is equal to big O of x squared, big O of x, or big O of 1. Would it be correct to say that x cubed is also equal to big O of x to the 4 as x approaches 0? Well, no. To see why, we can go back to our definition. If x cubed were equal to big O of x to the 4, 
it would mean that x cubed in absolute value is bounded by a constant c times the absolute value of x to the 4. If we divide both sides by x to the 4, we'd find that 1 over the absolute value of x is less than or equal to a constant. But that's not going to be possible, because near x equals 0, 1 over x blows up to infinity. So okay, we can't say that x cubed is equal to big O of x to the 4 as x goes to 0, but we can say that x cubed is equal to big O of x to the 4 as x goes to infinity. After all, when x goes off to infinity, the absolute value of x cubed is less than or equal to the absolute value of x to the 4. Just like in our first example, we get 1 as the constant in the definition of big O. This example is important because it shows that the choice of x0, the point where you're measuring the size of your function, really is important when writing f equals big O of g. Here's a slightly different example where we aren't just considering powers of x. You may have seen this inequality in the past. The absolute value of sine of x is less than or equal to the absolute value of x for all real numbers x. Well, according to our definition of big O, this is saying that sine of x is equal to big O of x. This actually holds everywhere, but in particular it holds when x approaches 0. Alternatively, if we divide both sides of this inequality by the absolute value of x, we find that the absolute value of sine x over x is less than or equal to 1. This will hold for all x not equal to 0. According to our definition of big O, sine x over x is equal to big O of 1 as x approaches 0. So even though this function is not defined at x not equals 0, we can still say it's equal to big O of 1 because this inequality holds for all points nearby. Let's talk a little bit more about properties of big O. So suppose that we have two functions, f and g. f is equal to big O of x to the m, and g is equal to big O of x to the n as x goes to 0. What can we say about the order of the product of f and g? What about the sum? To answer these questions, we have to go back to the definition of big O. According to our definition, for x values near 0, we have that the absolute value of f of x is bounded by a constant a times the absolute value of x to the m. Similarly, the absolute value of g of x is bounded by a constant b times the absolute value of x to the n. What can we say about the product of f and g? Well, let's see. The absolute value of the product, f of x, g of x, should be equal to the absolute value of f of x times the absolute value of g of x. Well, now hold on a second. We know that the absolute value of f is bounded above by a times the absolute value of x to the m. And we know that the absolute value of g is bounded above by b times the absolute value of x to the n. Recombining, I get ab times the absolute value of x to the m plus n. This is an upper bound for the product of f and g near x equals 0. So what do we conclude? Well, according to the definition of big O, f g is of order x to the m plus n as x goes to 0. We can do something similar for the sum of f and g. To bound the absolute value of f of x plus g of x, we can use the triangle inequality. The upper bound is the absolute value of f of x plus the absolute value of g of x. But of course, based on our assumptions, this is less than or equal to a times the absolute value of x to the m plus b times the absolute value of x to the n. Hmm, now I don't see a nice easy way to recombine this into a single term. But let's think back to one of our earlier examples when we talked about the order of x cubed. We saw that as x goes to 0, x cubed is equal to big O of x squared. It's also equal to big O of x. We can drop the powers of x to the m when x goes to 0. These functions are getting bigger. So in this case, I think we can probably replace x to the m or x to the n with whichever exponent is smaller. One of them has to be smaller, so let's just suppose that it's m. Suppose that m is less than or equal to n. I can therefore replace the absolute value of x to the n with the absolute value of x to the m. That gives me an upper bound of a plus b times the absolute value of x to the m. According to our definition of big O, the order of f plus g as x goes to 0 is x to the m. The sum of the two functions is big O of x to the q, where q is the smaller exponent of m and n. Throughout this video, we've seen several examples and touched on various properties of big O. 
We're going to need those properties in the next video when we talk about Taylor series, so let's list them now. Any properties that we haven't already proven will follow very quickly from the definition of big O. So as an exercise, try to write down an argument. Okay, the following hold as x goes to 0. First, we saw in example 1 that if you take a function that's of order x to the n and you multiply that function by k, well, it's still going to be of order x to the n. On the last slide, we saw that if you add a function of order x to the m to a function of order x to the n, the result is going to be of order x to the q, where q here is the smaller exponent of m and n. When you multiply two functions, the usual exponent laws hold for big O. A function of order x to the m times a function of order x to the n will be a function of order x to the m plus n. If instead you multiply m functions, each of order x to the n, well that n exponent is going to add m times. The resulting function is going to be of order x to the m n. Finally, if you take a function of order x to the m and you divide it by x to the n, you're going to end up with a function of order x to the m minus n. And there you go, some of your basic properties of big O notation. Try to get comfortable with these statements and we'll put them to use in the next video.